to create a bone structure and function presented by Yuri Musevi. So I have an overview of what the entire unit on plant structure and function entails. And then you should have a look at different sections as far as plant structure and function is concerned. So under this particular unit, plant structure and function, we shall look at the following. We we'll have discussed the features of plant cells. We shall look at the different types of cells in plants and uh, the tissues of plants. We shall describe the main function and the basic structure of uh, the plant organs, that is the stem, the roots, and the leaves. So to start off with our first lesson, we have a plant cell, and here we shall look at uh, the diagram of the plant cell. We shall look at uh, the distinguishing features between the plant cell and the animal cell. And we shall also describe the key organelles that are found in the plant cell. For the plant cell, for the plants generally, we say the plant cells are eukaryotic in nature. By eukaryotic means the cell of a plant has got a nucleus that is bound by a membrane and also has organelles that are bound by a membrane. We find that for the plant cells, they tend to be either rectangular or cube shaped. Generally, they tend to be larger than the animal cell. There are some similarities between the animal cell and the plant cell, where the key differences is that uh, the plant cell tends to have some additional structures that are not present in the animal cell. So the distinguishing features of a plant cell, we have the arom five. We talk about the cell wall. So the plant cell has a cell wall which is not there in the animal cell. They have got plasmids. Plasmids are basically small spherical structures that are found in the cytoplasm of the plant cell. There are generally three types of plasmids: the chloroplasts, the leucoplasts, and the aminoplasts. We have the other distinguishing feature is that plant cells have a large, centrally placed single vacuole. And this vacuole is also covered or surrounded by a membrane, which takes us to the other distinguishing features of the plant cell is that they have two cell membranes. First, the cell membrane that covers the central cell vacuole that we call the thermoplast and the other cell membrane that covers the cytoplasm, what we normally refer to as, generally, the plasma membrane. And lastly, the other distinguishing feature for the plant cells is the presence of plasma based matter. Plasma based matter are small channels that are found in the cell wall. Because the cell wall is rigid, the cell wall does not allow things to pass through. Yet, the cell membrane normally allows things to pass through. So we find that the cell wall has got small channels in it that allow substances to pass through, therefore bringing in the possibility or enabling substances to pass through the cell wall. For illustration of what the plant cell looks like, this is what we have. So in the plant cell, generally, we have got at the center there, we have got the large centrally placed sub vacuum that we talked about, Basically, it contains water, mineral salts, and some sugar as well. And then we have that vacuum is covered by a membrane that we refer to as the tonoplast. And then after the vacuum, we have now the cytoplasm with structures normally associated with the cytoplasm. Here we find the cell organelles, such as the mitochondrion, also found in animal cell, the endoplasmic reticulum. Um, the Golgi apparatus, and so on. And then you find the cytoplasm is also surrounded by the normal cell membrane that we refer to as the plasma membrane. So this one here. Now, within the cytoplasm is where you find these small spherical structures that we refer to as the plasmids. So you find a number of plasmids within the cytoplasm 
in addition to the other organelles that are found in the cytoplasm. And then after the cell membrane, we now have the cell wall. So we have the cell wall that is basically is made up of cellulose in addition to other polysaccharides. Now to briefly look at the structures associated with the plant cell, we have there is the cell wall. The cell wall being the rigid structure that surrounds the plasma membrane. And the cell wall is basically made up of cellulose and other polysaccharides. It tends to protect the plant cell and it also regulates to some degree the life cycle of the plant. So for the cell wall, it is rigid in nature. And that gives us the plant cell its rigid characteristic. And then we have the plastids. Plastids that are basically found in the cytoplasm. And we talked about three plastids. There are a number of different types of plastids, but the key ones are the chloroplasts, the aminoplasts, the lipoplasts. Then in addition, we also have the chromoplasts. The chloroplasts generally are the plastids that are commonly referred to because these are the ones that tend to contain the pigment we call chlorophyll, and therefore they tend to act as the site for photosynthesis. For the rest of the plastids, we have the amyloplasts play the role of a site for the synthesis and storage of starch. So they are basically starch granules. And then we have the leucoplasts, they are colorless, they also tend to store starch. Chromoplasts, on the other hand, they tend to store the pigments, the color pigments, basically contributing to the color that you find the plant bearing. Then we also have the endoplasm in particular, playing the same role the endoplasm in particular plays in the plant cell. It acts as an intracellular network for the transport of substances within the cell also plays a role in the synthesis and the other processes within the cell. The nucleus plays the same role that the nucleus does. It basically controls the production of the cell, and it also serves as the center for information processing within the cell. So it plays a role also in terms of the cell growth and development. The vacuum does the business of storing the compounds that help the plant in terms of growth and also plays a structural role as far as the plant cell is concerned. Gold apparatus, they serve as a distribution and transport organelle where basically they store some of the cell products that are synthesized by the cell. And then they release these products when they are needed in the required amount. Other organelles that you may want to talk about as far as the plant cell is concerned, we have the mitochondria that you can read about, but we know basically mitochondria serve the purposes of acting as the site for cell respiration. That is why we have where we have respiration taking place with the formation of cellular energy. Cellular energy that is used in other processes within the cell, so talk about it is used for cellular processes as well as growth and development of the cell. We have the microfilaments also that are found within the cell playing various roles. We have the plasma matter. Plasma matter, which is said are small channels found in the cell wall that provide a route by which substances can go across or through the cell wall. There are the ribosomes. Ribosomes associated with the endoplasmic reticulum they tend to contain all the proteins that are needed for the purposes of protein synthesis. So the ribosomes play the role of protein synthesis. And because they're found on the endoplasmic reticulum, they are therefore, in addition, make the endoplasmic reticulum now to act as the site for protein synthesis within the cell. And this brings us to the end of our first lesson about the structure of the plant cell and the organelles within it. Now, welcome to our lecture two, our second lesson, where in this particular lesson, 
we shall look at the types of plant cells. Now, plants have got different types of cells, which vary in terms of the specialization and in terms of the functions that they do. So, they tend to vary in terms of structure and also function. Now, there are basically five types of plant cells. The types of plant cells that we have, there are the parenchyma cells, there are the colenchyma cells, thirdly, sparenchyma cells, the epidermal cells, and lastly, the conducting cells. Now, generally, as you said, the different types of cells vary in terms of structure and also in terms of function. So, to start off with the parenchyma cells, the parenchyma cells, generally, these tend to be unspecialized cells found in the plant. They have got a primary cell work that is made up of cellulose. For them, they tend to have a thin cell wall, and they contain chloroplasts. For these particular cells, they tend to play a key role in terms of the growth of the plant and also in terms of photosynthesis. So we tend to find them in the growing regions of the plants, where as specialists as they are, they will still undergo cell division to form many more cells. So their functions based on the structure, they play the role of photosynthesis, they play a role in cellular respiration, and they also play the role of storage. And then we have the colonchyma cells. For the colonchyma cells, they tend to be elongated. For them, they've got a primary cell that has undergone some thickening. So for them, we say they also have a secondary cell wall. And this secondary cell wall is thick, but the thickness is not uniform. So we we'll talk about them having a secondary cell wall with a uniform thickness. The thickness varies from one part of the cell to the other. For the important time of cells with the secondary wall, they tend to have a fairly strong thickened wall. And therefore, in terms of their function, we find the color in cells, they play the role of support. Wherever you find them, we find them supporting the plant structures. They help a lot with giving the plant wind resistance characteristics. So the plant will be able to withstand the wind because of the support provided by the color in cells. So because we find them providing support to the rest of the plant structures, you will find the main referred to as supporting cells, where they are seen to provide mechanical support. Then we have the sparenchyma cells. Now, sparenchyma cells, we have two types of sparenchyma cells. That is the sclerase, which are branch cells, and the fibers, which are unbranched cells. So, in terms of the structure of the sclerenchyma cells, sclerenchyma also has a secondary cell wall, just like the parenchyma. Now, then, this secondary cell wall that they have, this time the thickness is fairly uniform. And then, in addition, this wall is strengthened by the position of strengthening material such as lignin. So, the wall is not only strong. It's not only thick, but has got additional material in it, such as lignin and so on. Now, we tend to find the function of the sparenchyma cells based on the fact that the walls are strengthened by having the material deposited in it. They play the role of support. They also play the role of strengthening. So, you find them providing support and strength to other structures within the plant. Whereby we may find the kind of sparenchyma cells you find in the different structures in the plant, they may either be sclerins or they may be fibers. Now, sclerins are normally associated with the fruits. Where we tend to find the fruits that contain sclerins in them are referred to as stone fruits. And those are the fruits you are likely to find that as you eat, they become across a hard structure within the fruit, where the hard structure basically has the sclerins within the fruit. And then we have the epidermal cells. 
epidermal cells, as the name suggests, they are associated with the epidermis. The epidermis being the outer covering of the plant structures. So generally for epidermal cells, we associate them with the outer covering of the plant structures. The characteristic of the epidermal cells is that given that they found on the surface, forming the protective covering on the surface, they find the cells tend to be flat in nature. They don't have chloroplasts, so they don't play a role in photosynthesis. For the function of the epidermal cells, we find they form the epidermis, which is the outer covering that tends to cover the surfaces of the plant. And this outer covering, we tend to find it may be covered by a protective layer called the cuticle. So generally, as the epidermis is providing protection and covering, the cuticle on the epidermis is tends to be waterproof and it is actually also not permeable to respiratory gases. So the cuticle tends to prevent excessive loss of water from the surface of the plant. And you tend to find the thickness of the cuticle might be more on the one covering the upper epidermis compared to the cuticle on the lower epidermis. Indeed, in some plants, we may find the cuticle may not be there in the lower epidermis. Now, the upper epidermis tends to have more stomata compared to the lower epidermis. Now, the lower epidermis tends to have more stomata compared to the upper epidermis, whereas stomata are basically openings in the epidermis that are covered or rather guarded by some cells that we call the guard cells. For the epidermis, you may find the epidermal cells may undergo modifications to form different kinds of modified structures of the epidermis of the respective plant. And then lastly, we have the conducting cells. Now, conducting cells are basically the cells that form the vessels in the plant, or what you form, the conducting vessels. These conducting vessels are basically the xylem and the phloem. Now, for the case of the xylem vessel, we find the xylem made up of two types of cells, the vessel elements and the tracheids. The vessel elements, they tend to be elongated cylindrical cells, and we tend to find that these cells have got pores on the sides that allow water to be able to pass through, and we also find that they are connected to one another at the ends, and the horizontal wall between two vessel elements is also incomplete, therefore allowing also movement of water from one vessel element to the other. Tracheids, on the other hand, they only have pores in the walls that allow water to pass through. So for the cells that make up the xylem, basically they allow water to pass through, and therefore, they give us the xylem, which is a water conducting vessel. And then we have the phloem, a vessel that is responsible for the transportation of food materials. The phloem is also comprising of two types of cells. We have the sieve tube members, and we have the sieve cells. Both of them capable of allowing soluble food material to pass through, but the sieve tube members are more efficient compared to the sieve cells. And generally, we tend to find for the sieve tube members, for them, they tend to have at the end walls, they have good pores within which food materials can pass through. Where the pores, basically, they allow for the movement of the food materials from one member to another responsible for the transportation of soluble organic food material. And thus the much you should say as far as the types of cells in plants are concerned. And now we move on to our next lesson, where we shall talk about the tissues found in the plants. We have talked about basically five types of plant cells. Now, when we have a collection of similar cells coming together and performing a specific test, that gives us the tissues. So, in our plant tissues, 
Well, the plant species are classified into two major types of plant species. The plant trees we have, they can either be meristematic trees or they can be permanent trees. So we have got two main categories of plant trees. Now, for the meristematic tissue, meristematic tissue basically comprises of cells that are either undifferentiated or they are incompletely differentiated. So these cells are capable of undergoing cell division and forming new cells. For that reason, therefore, they contribute towards growth in the plant. For the permanent tissue, permanent tissue comprises of differentiated plant cells. These differentiated plant cells are no longer capable of undergoing cell division. For any plant cell that undergoes differentiation, a completely differentiated cell does not undergo cell division. It loses its ability to undergo cell division. When you talk about a cell being differentiated, it is when a cell develops to become a specific type of a cell that forms a specific function. And for a plant cell to become differentiated, they become differentiated by undergoing changes in the cytoplasm and as well as in the cell wall. So to look at the two types of tissue, we begin with the meristematic tissue. We talked about the meristematic tissue, which we also simply refer to as meristems, is tissue made up of what we refer to as meristematic cells. Now, the meristem comprises of basically a group of cells, of basically meristematic cells, which retain the ability to undergo cell division by mitosis. As they undergo cell division by mitosis, usually what the cells do, in mitosis there are two daughter cells. So one cell is retained to continue with the business of cell division, while the other daughter cell is allowed to undergo differentiation. That is to become a specific type of a cell that performs specific functions. Now, for these cells that form the meristematic tissue, or what you also refer to as the meristematic cells, they have got certain characteristics. For the characteristics of the meristematic cells, one, they tend to be small in size. Secondly, the shape that they have is either a spherical shape, an oval shape, or a polygonal shape. For the meristematic cells, they tend to be tightly packed together with no spaces in between the cells. So we say that the characteristic of being compact and with no intercellular spaces. The other characteristic of the meristematic cells is that they have a lot of cytoplasm and have a large prominent nucleus. So we say they have got abundant cytoplasm and a prominent nucleus. And lastly, they do not have vacuoles. And if at all the vacuoles are present, they tend to be very small in size. Now, for this meristematic tissue we are talking about, we have got different types of meristematic tissue. And we classify them according to the location of the meristematic tissue. That is depending on where they are found. So as we look at the classification of meristematic tissue, which is based on the location. Generally, we have got three types of meristematic tissue based on where they are found. So the first type of meristematic tissue that we have, we have the apical meristems. These are meristematic tissue that are found at the tip of the stem and the roots. So because they are found at the tip of the stem and the roots, that is where they refer to as apical meristems, 
apical meaning the found at the apex or at the tip. Now, for this particular medicines, they cause an increase in length as far as the plant growth is concerned. So, because they cause an increase in length at the tip of the shoot and the root, they cause vertical growth in the plant. And for this plant, therefore, we, this medicine, therefore, we say they are found at the tip of the shoot and the root, and they are responsible for the vertical growth of the plant, vertical growth that causes an increase in the length. The kind of growth caused by the apical meristems is referred to as primary growth, the initial growth that takes place in any given plant. And then we have the second type of meristematic GC, that is the lateral meristems. Now, lateral meristems tend to be found on the sides. So the term lateral actually means on the sides. For these particular medicines that are found on the sides, they cause an increase in thickness or depth of the plant. And because they cause an increase in thickness of the plant, they are said to cause horizontal growth. So they are responsible for the horizontal growth of the plant. There is an increase in thickness. Or as some will tell you, an increase in the depth of the plant. Now, because the cost increase in the parts of the plant that already formed, lateral medicines are said to be responsible for secondary growth of the, in the plant. Now, generally, for the lateral medicines, there are two types of lateral medicines. We have got the cup cambium, and we have got the competition. So, I've got the cup cambium, and we've got the vascular cambium, so to speak. Now, for the vascular cambium, which is a type of the lateral meristem, this is a lateral meristem that is found associated with the vascular tissue. So it is found in between the xylem and the phloem. And the vascular cambium associated with the vascular tissue causes secondary growth in the xylem and in the phloem. And then we've got the cork cambium. Cork cambium is a type of lateral meristem that is found just beneath the epidermis in the stem. So usually, it causes the thickening associated with the epidermis in the stem, and it is responsible for formation of the bark of the stem in the woody plants. And then you have the third type of meristematic tissue, that is the intercalary meristems. Now, intercalary meristems are found in the internodes in between the permanent tissue. Now, because they're found in the internals, that is where they derive their name from, the reason why they're referred to as intercalary meristems. For intercalary meristems, they cause, basically they exist for a short period of time, and then they end up merging with the permanent tissue. So they're not always found in the plant. They are seasonal. And then for them, they cause increase in the length of the internals. So generally, they are responsible for increase in length in the plant in other parts of the plant except the shoot and the root. Because remember I said in the shoot and the root, we find the apical medicines. So any other increase in length in any other part of the plant, other than at the shoot and at the root, is caused by intercalary medicines. So because they are caused an increase in length, they also therefore are responsible for vertical growth in any other parts of the plant other than the tip of the root and the tip of the shoot. Now, you already mentioned that generally, for the meristematic tissue, they're the ones that uh, are made up of cells that are retain their ability to undergo cell division. And the same for them, generally. And the time they undergo mitosis and form two daughter cells, one daughter cell is retained to keep on with the B cell division, while the other daughter cell is allowed to undergo differentiation and give rise to the permanent tissue. Because this said once a cell undergoes differentiation, it can no longer undergo cell division. 
and it develops to become a specific type of a cell that carries out a specific function. So you have generally, when the mesomagic cell tissue are undergoing division, they also end up giving rise to those that will undergo differentiation, therefore forming the permanent tissue. Now, when it comes to the permanent tissue, we have got different types of permanent tissue that are formed. And generally, we expect all permanent tissue are made up of fully differentiated plant cells. So, for the types of, the types of permanent tissue that you find in the plant, we have got three main categories of permanent tissue. We have the ground tissue. Where the ground tissue are basically tissue that are made up of generally the parenchyma cells, the parenchyma cells, and the parenchyma cells. They give rise to various types of tissue in the plant that you call the brown tissue. And the purpose of the ground tissue is that they act as sites for photosynthesis. They also provide support. They also work together with the vascular tissue. And they help in the storage of food materials as well as water and so on. And then we have the dermal tissue. The dermal tissue are associated with the epidermis. They are the ones that form the protective layer that covers and protects the plant. So they are normally found on the surfaces of the plant. The third type of common tissue we have are the vascular tissue. Now, vascular tissue basically these are the tissue that form the, vas the vessels, that is the xylem and the phloem. So, they tend to form the vessels responsible for transport of water and mineral salts, and also the transport of food material within the plant. So, therefore, the vascular tissue basically gives us the xylem, responsible for the transport of water and mineral salts, and the phloem, responsible for the transport of the food materials. Now, generally, when it comes to the permanent tissue, that is also referred to as the secondary tissue, the permanent tissue can either be simple or it can be complex. As we say, the permanent tissue, we said basically we have got to three types. Either it is epidermal, dermal tissue, or it is ground tissue, or it is vascular tissue. Now, depending on whether the permanent tissue is made up of one type of a cell or is made up of different types of cells, then we can categorize our permanent or secondary tissues into two. Either it is simple tissue or it is complex tissue. It is simple if it is made up of only one type of a cell. And it is complex if it is made up of different types of cells. Now, example of simple permanent tissue is the dermal tissue, because basically the dermal tissue is made up of epidermal cells only. So it is made up of only one type of a cell qualifying to be simple tissue. Then it comes the vascular tissue, xylem and phloem. We find the vascular tissue being made up of different types of cells. So, because they're made up of different types of cells, they therefore qualify to be complex tissue. For example, we find in the case of the xylem, the xylem is made up, we say it can be made up of two types of cells, the vessel elements or the trapeze, both of which can allow transport of water to take place. But we find the xylem also is associated with the parenchyma cells that play a supportive role to the vessel elements. So, because the xylem is made up of now the vessel elements, the trapeze, as well as the parenchyma cells, it therefore qualifies to be complex tissue. Now, likewise, we find the flyer. Why we said it is responsible for the transportation of food materials, soluble food materials. Transporting the food materials from the leaves where photosynthesis takes place and the food materials are basically made there, and transporting the food material to the other parts of the plant. Now we tend to find the flying is made up of different types of cells. We have got 
It's made up of the CSS. We have the field team members, and then we have the component cells, which happen to be parenchyma cells, and also other type of parenchyma cells that support the cells that make up the flowing, and also the flowing fibers. So given that it is made up of different types of cells, the flowing therefore also as vascular tissue qualifies to be complex tissue. Now, for the dermal tissues, generally, dermal tissue is said to qualify to be simple tissue. And we said for the dermal tissue made up of the epidermal cells, the epidermal cells basically can undergo modifications to play various roles. And some of them can become modified to play a specific role. So they undergo specialization. And the degree of specialization the epidermal cells undergo will vary from one type of plant to the other. So you find some of the specialized cells associated with epidermal cells. We have the guard cells that are normally found uh, basically at the opening of the stomata. And the guide cells play the role of controlling the opening and the closing of the stomata. And as they do so, they regulate and control the loss of water from the plant. They also control respiration by controlling the movement in and out of the respiratory gases into the plant. And then we have the trichomes also, which are modifications associated with epidermal cells. Trichomes basically play a role in regulating loss of water from the plant cell and so on. And then we have the root hairs, also associated with epi the epidermal cells. Root hairs increase the surface area of the root. We tend to find the root hairs also facilitate and play a role in the absorption of water by the roots because they don't have a cuticle. So root hairs along with the tip of the roots play a role, a big role, in terms of absorption of water by the roots and also absorption of mineral salts that come in along with the water. And with that, we complete the series of looking at the types of tissues that you find in the plants. And that brings us to the end. These televised lectures supplement our robust online learning going on on our MKU online platform. You can view more on our televised lectures via our online platform. We are in a digital era and Mount Kenya University knows this. The following are the steps to follow so as to complete your online application. Download the application form from the website www.mku.ac.ke Attach copies of your academic certificates and ID. Pay the application fees via M-Pesa pay bill number 270988. Your ID is the account number. 2,000 shillings is the charge for a postgraduate. You can also deposit in the bank accounts provided on the website. Then email all the above to apply at mku.ac.ke.